Thank you very much, Paula. And uh, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. And do you want to field your own question? Sure. Okay. I have a question. <laughs> start, yeah. start the ball yes. rolling. <laughs> um, so this is really intriguing, the idea, and I think it explains a lot of things, the idea about ancestral uh, practices, and we talked earlier about genealogy and how that still is important, that um, you do what you're born into. But what do you do then about the language in um, Romans about grafting, being grafted in, or the language in Galatians about being adopted in. That implies... Um, what is it genealogically about that is no matter how much you love your adopted child, what is absolutely true about your adopted child relative to you genealogically? Right, they're not. You're not related. Right. They're adopted. Oh, so and that's take that exactly as the, um, what he's doing is right. there is, he's announcing, um, that actually... Okay, but grafting is different. Yes, grafting is different. And the olive tree metaphor has been, let me mix metaphors because he's doing it, um, a stumbling block um, uh, for exegesis and commentaries. But let me, let me speak to the adoption issue. Right there you see the strength of that Mediterranean idea. If these people can call God Abba, they've been brought into the family. But they're adopted. They have to remain Gentiles. Okay, so they right. don't adopt the ancestral practices. They do not, that Abraham is not their Abba, or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not their Abba. They're, right. they're adopted, but okay. they're in the same family. The other thing is that if you look at the, these themes from Jewish eschatology at the bottom of page two, um, Jewish apocalyptic eschatological thought breaks the connection between um, ethnicity and divinity. Because what it's saying is that all the divinities and the other ethnic groups will all worship the Jewish God. And that's where the break is. This is very unhelpfully described as universalism versus particularism. It's not about any of that. But it, it breaks that connection. But when Paul is talking about how the Gentiles are brought in, they're adopted, which makes He's okay. a Roman. I mean, besides yeah, being yeah, Jewish, no. he's Roman. Right, right. Okay. About the olive tree? About grafting, yeah. i got to work on that. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Yeah, I just a follow-up on, on that. Um, there's a places, I mean, we're not too sure what's going on with, with Paul, whether he is at times abandoning his ethnic practices at times for, um, for periods, you know, like, say, say, the food practices or whatever. Uh, Where would you see that he... Well, it's, it's, yeah, that's why I'm saying there's some debate about whether he is and whether other Jews are. He's definitely accused of doing that by people who perhaps maybe miss whether they reflecting the truth or not. Well, the um, truth. Yeah. Not only is he... Uh, I don't know where he's accused of doing that, but he yeah. certainly is claimed to have done that by 99.9% .9 mm. of New Testament scholars. Yeah. Uh, my point is that by telling Gentiles that they don't have to assume Jewish practices, we're not, it doesn't mm -hmm. tell us anything about his personal practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the least apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. Are there rabbis? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 say, there's, you know, there is a bit of debate so whether he did or did not give up food practices. There is no debate. Yeah. In New Testament scholarship, yeah. everybody assumes yeah. that he's a Protestant and he has given up. He's given yeah, up. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm saying there is a, there is a you know, that's why I'm saying there is a there, debate. Unless yeah. there's not a debate. I mean, well, yeah, exactly, that's the, yeah. even the people who do the, um, do you know well, the I difference see between the Sondervegh, yeah, yeah. the, the, yeah. the two paths of salvation? Yeah. Even those people who say that Paul preached uh, salvation of the Gentiles through Jesus and salvation for Jews through Torah, still just assume that Paul mm -hmm. stopped keeping uh, Jewish ancestral practices. Mm -hmm. There's no reason. There, there, yeah. On the basis of mm -hmm. his saying that to Gentiles, there's, we're not given any information about what he's doing himself. Yeah, because that's why I read it. It's yeah, questionable it's, the passages they quote as. There's no reason. Both just ways, because yeah. he's saying, you yeah. know. You know, eat, eat what you want, um, but don't do it in a public cultic situation. You know, he still could come from home with a tuna sandwich. I have no idea. <laughs> right? Um, yes, please. Uh, I'm working now on the, the Dieppe of Julians, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think about a uh, 
Julian's definition of Christian as Galileans um, because the, their doctrine fell between, fell between the, um, the national gods of the Greeks and the national god of the Hebrews. So Julian says that you, uh, your religion is a fabrication, a plasma. What do you think about Julian's? Well, Julian obviously had issues. Um, <laughs> You know, the Christian emperor killing most of the males in this family um, upset him. Um, and he, um, he likes, one of the reasons he likes Judaism, and it's interesting, what he's done is put a positive uh, valence on an anti-Jewish criticism of Judaism, which is that animal sacrifice was really paganism. And Jews, by offering animals, were really like idol worshippers. And then you point to the the uh, golden calf, and you say, you, you, you Jews are really idol worshippers, and, and Christians aren't. Julian looked at animal sacrifice and said, you worship God the right way, he's saying to Jews, because you too know that you should worship through sacrifices. And he's pointing to Christians as cultic deviants, because they, they don't do that. So ex exactly the, uh, what he criticizes, uh, what Christians, uh, what the criticisms of Judaism that he had brought, been brought up with, he turns into a positive thing. Because, it, and he's saying the same thing, gee, you're really just like us pagans, um, after he comes out. He, um, <coughs> is, you know, are you familiar with the Contra Kelsum? Uh, origins in with that, that it's it's the same thing that, that these these Gentiles who are not true to their own ancestral customs, but they're not true to Jewish <coughs> ancestral custom either, are just deviants. It's one of the, it's one of the, the pagan packages of, of anti-Christian um, criticism. And of course, um, Origen has no trouble responding to that at length. But do you think that the, the, the word Galilean, Galileos, the way of saying your your God is not even national is just a, is a sectional or is uh, is even smaller than a national God like the God of the Hebrews because it's making it a re well I don't know because gods are so local right in antiquity really, I mean being really local <laughs> local isn't um, isn't a bad thing it's an, that's how you encounter divinity is by the way from one place to another, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's a good question. I'm glad you're working on Julian, he's one of the, yeah. one of the favorites. Yes, please. Thanks, Paul, it's just pretty stimulating. Um, but it leads me to just, just two, I guess, two comments. One is, on your model, and it is persuasive, rather than convert, what people would do would be bad. They would add goals to their Correct. repertoire. And you see that in the magical literature, where they simply add gods, and you get they add the Christian god that, mm -hmm. that, it, that starts in the third century and carries on the young one. It leads me to think that we should think of Christian conversion, so-called conversion to this Jesus movement, and later to the Christian church, could conceivably have been the same thing. And there's evidence, there seems to be evidence of it's always indirect because the discourse is that of people who want more exclusive observance. So, have you thought about what quote unquote conversion would have meant within the Jesus movement and then the Christian movement afterward. Whether in fact because there are two problems I mean it's it's more plausible that people would have been would have just added. What's harder to explain is why people would have given up so much. It's right. Well giving and you you give up um, you <laughs> give up your gods at risk because mm -hmm. Paul isn't saying your gods don't exist. He's saying, look, you're they're harassing me too, but it'll be all right very soon. Um, I, th I think the reason they give up, there's a kind of empowerment, let's take Corinthians uh, as an example, because that's one of the thickest descriptions we have of uh, um, ex-pagan pagans who have made an exclusive commitment to the God of Israel, or, or at least they better. There's that gentleman who Paul mentions, in, um, um, who's a baptized Christian who worships idols again, and Paul says, don't even eat with him again, he's, he's finished. But these people are, are charismatically endowed. They're able to discern between spirits. They're able to heal. They have prophecies. There's a kind of eschatological energy that is infectious, that is one of the, again, um, elements in the mix that proves that there's, uh, this isn't just 
interesting behaviors that they're manifesting. It's the presence of spirit in them, Paul says. And this, I think, is something that, um, I mean, even Romans seems to have, and Paul hasn't been to Rome yet, this idea of, the, of, of having the, the spirit come into you once you're baptized and, and therefore empowering you, I think was something that um, was one of the strongest appeals. And that's what you get. You get empowered. You can control demons. You can heal. You have visions. Um, and that's, and also, I mean, there's, um, you know what time it is on God's clock. That's a lot of power. What's interesting is how it survives after that first generation. <laughs> really? And the extent to which it does. That's what it it, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. you know, this is one of the uh, John Gager's catchphrases in Kingdom and Community that Christianity succeeds precisely as its major prophecy fails. The kingdom of God is at hand, not. And and yet it, it, it just grows and grows and grows. But we, again, are, this is where our academic vocabulary makes our, our, our effort at historical analysis more difficult. We, we talk, and this is a, a problem with talking about uh, Judaism too, because those isms were the Christian, the abstractions imply a kind of identity over time. But Christianity in the fourth century and what Paul's talking about in the mid first century are only notionally, only notionally related. It's not all Christianity. If I could just follow up, I think that explaining the model of adding makes more sense later on. It explains why Christianity continues to thrive because there's kind of a messianic <coughs> that still works that bishops are happy with, but clearly it's has um, um, Right. Well, and as long as you're not actually sacrificing, I mean, you keep there are all sorts of accommodations that are made to. But you need to have lower powers work with you. I mean, those are the things that cause your infections and when you lose something and so on. And eventually, saints will slot into that that function very, very nicely. Has anybody here been to Italy? I mean, you'll notice when you're in, you know, you're at a crossroad, and there'll be a niche with a cult figure, um, a saint. And, and very often there'll be flowers or a candle or something. I mean, that's, that's good. Don't fix what isn't broken. That's good Mediterranean stuff. Uh, you want somebody local to be presiding over here. Is, um, are we out of time? No. No, 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 no. Sorry, just the Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can they have a carrot stick the before they do <laughs> a carrot stick? <laughs> Listen to all this and not even say that. Well, it's a very interesting link you're making here with um, uh, the apocalyptic tradition and uh, uh, Paul's adaptation of it. And your hypothesis is that uh, it's because of those convictions that he speaks about these Gentiles, or he thinks about these Gentiles, um, in terms of them being the sort of people who. Uh, are uh, described in the apocalyptic thinking that you, that you outlined. Uh, is there anywhere in Paul's writings themselves that he, he comes close to making that link? The link between his Gentiles and the coming kingdom of God? Yes. Because that's the reason why he, according to the, the outline here, uh, I think I've got your hypothesis right. That's the reason why they don't have to convert. How about Romans 15? Which part of it? <laughs> um, <coughs> rejoice, O, o nations, with his no, people. I yeah, but I think I'm trying to remember yeah. the number. 15, 8, I think, but it's rejoice, O nations. When he has um, the root of Jesse rises to uh, rule the nations, and him shall the nations hope. And he has that whole katena of quotations mm -hmm. from from Psalms and different passages talking about the nations rejoicing with, um, with Israel and the coming of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in effect, those verses from Romans 15 um, are a reprise of his argument in 9 to 11, I think, where he makes the case. Mm -hmm. Do you know the book by James Scott? I just discovered it in 1995. Um, it's Paul and the Nations. He goes through tracking from the Septuagint through Romans, that, that collocation of, of verses of all the, the pleroma of the nations and all Israel. And, and Paul exactly touches on that in Romans 15. And a good thing, or I couldn't have answered your question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?